At 1.23 a.m. on Saturday, April 26, 1986, a failed experiment blew the 500-ton safety cap off the Vladimir Ilyich Lenin nuclear power plant's reactor number four. According to Sasha Yuvchenko, a member of Chernobyl's night shift, the building's thick concrete walls, quote, were bent like rubber. Further recalling the event for the Guardian newspaper in 2004, Yuvchenko said, quote, there was no ceiling, only sky, a sky full of stars. Ionization radiation shot into the air like a blue laser beam as the core of the nuclear reactor was exposed to the world. He remembered, quote, thinking how beautiful it was. Despite trying to hide the failure from the world, the sheer magnitude of the disaster soon called for a massive response force to be formed to deal with the fallout. Officials hastily assembled an army made up of firefighters, pilots, miners, and local volunteers. Their long list of tasks included removing the irradiated debris from around the reactor, constructing a sarcophagus which would entomb the destroyed reactor, wide-scale decontamination, road building, and the destruction and burial of contaminated buildings, forests, and equipment, not to mention animals, both wild and domesticated. To say that theirs was a mammoth task is an understatement. It was a cleanup effort that would span for three years following the disaster and put many of the first responders in mortal danger. While some in their ranks were forced by the superiors and Communist Party officials to work at Chernobyl by means of direct orders, many thousands more actually volunteered to participate in the Chernobyl cleanup. Many even extended their work in the zone beyond the initial compulsory term. These workers were called liquidators. The first liquidators. The term liquidator is derived from the Russian verb liquidator, which means to eliminate, or to eliminate the consequences of an accident. The initial phase of the Chernobyl cleanup effort comprised the first day in the immediate aftermath of the explosion of the number four reactor, leading up to the evacuation of the town of Pripyat three miles away. This first round of liquidators included those who responded just after the explosion occurred, those in the control room and various chambers of the reactor itself, as well as firefighters who responded during the early hours of that fateful morning. Firefighters from fire station number two of the Chernobyl plant comprised the very first responders to what was assumed to be an electrical fire on the roof of number three reactor. Ominously, they wore no protective clothing, and none had dosimetric equipment to measure radiation levels. Once the fires on the roof were under control many hours later, a group of firemen from the Pripyat Brigade climbed into the ruins of the reactor hall to aim their hoses on the glowing crater of the core itself, where the graphite was burning at temperatures of more than 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. These firemen were exposed to higher levels of radiation than even the victims of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima at the end of World War II. Some military units also arrived at the scene within the first day of the disaster. One soldier, Sergei Bondarenko, would later testify the following. The first day after the accident was a mess. No one knew what to do, and the residents of Pripyat were not informed about anything, and thus suspected nothing. The early phase, the mass liquidators. The so-called early phase ranges from the end of the evacuation of Pripyat to the end of the construction of the sarcophagus around the reactor in November 1986, seven months in total. This phase included the largest group of liquidators numbering in the hundreds of thousands, many of them conscripted or forced to participate. This group was put to work on a diverse range of dangerous tasks dealing with the decontamination and cleanup efforts in and around Chernobyl. Firemen continued to work on the scene, and thus also formed a crucial part of this phase of liquidators. It took them 10 days to bring the resulting fires around the nuclear plant, not including inside the reactor itself, under control. According to the World Nuclear Association, during those 10 days, the area around the Chernobyl plant experienced the most significant uncontrolled radioactive release in human history. Another vitally important group of liquidators were the helicopter pilots who flew as close to the destroyed and wide open reactor as possible in order to dump suppressants like boron, lead, clay, and sand onto it from above. Their orders were to drop 5,000 tons of this material by thousands of these helicopter sorties to ensure that the fire in the reactor's core was finally smothered. Every effort had to be made to ensure that the meltdown of the reactor's core was stopped 
before possible radiation of the Black Sea itself, not to mention numerous rivers in the region. If radiation found its way into the area's water supplies, the fallout would amplify the catastrophe significantly. 400 miners were brought in to excavate under the reactor to stop the meltdown. The miners concluded their digging of the needed 551-foot-long tunnel below the reactor on June 24, 1986, 60 days after the disaster. They even stripped naked, working in temperatures exceeding 122 degrees Fahrenheit to get the job done. Another group of liquidators was the so-called men on the roof. Radio-controlled vehicles, including a lunar vehicle from the USSR's doomed lunar program, were initially used to clean up the debris on the roof of Number 3 reactor, but all the machines failed as the radiation corroded and destroyed their electronic circuitry. Therefore, the cleanup crew was forced to use manpower. This particular crew was given the nickname Bio-Robots. The debris on the roof had to literally be removed by hand. Almost all these bio-robot liquidators were 35 to 40-year-old reservists called up by the armed forces who were given no choice in their assignment. The men were instructed to run onto the roof, throw as much radioactive debris and dust onto a shovel as they could carry, run to the side and lob it over the edge, then make a dash for the interior and hopeful safety. They had a mere 90 seconds to achieve this. General Tarakanov ordered these men to remove the lead sheets covering the walls of government subcommittee bureaus to make them into rudimentary protective clothing. However, this lead gear could only be worn once as it absorbed too much radioactivity. Many soldiers fashioned a fig leaf out of lead that they inserted between two layers of underwear. They also wore a lead cap as headgear and slipped lead padded soles into their boots. These soldiers lived in tent cities all around the 30 mile zone of alienation the exclusion zone that encompassed Chernobyl, Pripyat, and surrounding forests and villages. Many soldiers were tasked with using bulldozers and other earth-moving vehicles to level the highly irradiated and charred forest land in the zone. Miles of pine trees had died due to the extreme levels of radiation in what liquidators dubbed the Red Forest. These too had to be cleared and then buried. Following the clearings, convoys of trucks would sweep in, coating all the ground with a sticky solution that suppressed dust. These same trucks would be used to decontaminate all the buildings, roads, and other structures in the zone in continuous convoys that lasted for months. Copious amounts of the same solution were used, which was called burda, which means molasses. Hundreds of these lead-protected trucks were involved in the liquidation. However, each one had to be buried after just a few weeks of use due to the high levels of radiation. Soldiers, along with supervising groups of scientists, were also used to measure radiation and plant yellow flags in hotspots with high levels of radiation. Scientists included scores of chemist scouts who painstakingly measured radiation throughout the zone. Soldiers and police were also asked to provide security, access control to the zone, and oversee the continued evacuation of surrounding populations. There were even groups of female janitors who had to clear food left inside abandoned homes to prevent outbreaks of infectious diseases. A less well-known group of liquidators were the power station personnel who were required to operate the remaining three functioning reactors at Chernobyl and were bussed into and out of the plant every day for work. These included process engineers, nuclear physicists, logistics workers, technicians, and operators needed for a nuclear power station. After all, the Chernobyl plant still had to supply nearly 10% of the Soviet Union's energy need at the time. Construction of the sarcophagus that entombed the reactor began in June 1986 and lasted 206 days. The construction process consisted of eight stages and hundreds of construction workers were needed to work the 1,312,335 cubic feet of concrete and 7,300 tons of the metal framework used to erect the sarcophagus. A private company carried out the drilling operations on the perimeter of Chernobyl, Pripyat, and along the shoreline of local rivers and lakes to construct the so-called slurry wall. It aimed to prevent further contamination of watercourses due to radiation. A numbers game, the final liquidators. No exact number of liquidators has ever been established. Such was the breadth and scope of the containment effort and cleanup operations at Chernobyl. The official all-union distribution register of the USSR 
as compiled from 1986 to 1989, puts the total number of liquidators involved at 293,100. The report from the Russian National Medical Dosimetric Registry quotes 168,000 liquidators from Russia alone, with 123,536 liquidators from Ukraine and 63,500 liquidators from Belarus, this equated to around 355,000. Bear in mind that those were just three of the 15 Soviet Socialist Republics that comprised the USSR and that liquidators were sent from all over the Union. Another conservative estimate is that at least 300,000 to 350,000 people were directly involved in the cleanup operations, although the meaning of directly involved is in itself problematic and open to debate. A report by the Nuclear Energy Agency quotes a figure of up to 800,000. The international conference titled One Decade After Chernobyl refers to about 200,000 liquidators who worked in Chernobyl during the period of 1986 to 1987 and estimated the total number of people registered as involved in activities relating to alleviating the consequences of the accident as between 600,000 and 800,000. Interestingly, it's estimated that nearly 75% of the liquidators were aged between 30 to 44, and nearly 95% were men. All, save for a few foreign volunteer scientists, were Soviet citizens. Regarding radiation levels, the liquidators were exposed to an average of 120 millisieverts of radiation, about 1,200 times the amount from an X-ray. The fatalities, deformities, and other health complications that plagued the liquidators in the ensuing years became the tragic cost of mounting such an effort without the proper knowledge, equipment, or protocol. Somebody had to do it. It wouldn't be hyperbole to make the claim that the cleanup operation following the Chernobyl accident was the greatest such operation in history in terms of scope and accomplishment. And the hundreds of thousands of people who were the liquidators of Chernobyl did it out of a sense of duty, or of patriotism, or because they were simply ordered to do so. One former liquidator who survived the ordeal, named Alexander Feritov, put it this way. Somebody had to do it.